Hello everyone. Uh, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, August 5th, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. You might ask, what is CircuitPython? It is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes document, which I'll describe in a minute, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at sign CircuitPythonistas Discord role. As I mentioned, there's a shared notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. Right now, it's a Google Doc. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the document to skip around and view the parts of the meeting that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we'll post a link for next week's meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. This meeting is held in five parts, and I'll describe these as we get to each one. So we will start with community news, and I will take a timestamp. Um, so, uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm going to read some news items which come from our weekly Python for microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out by email on Monday mornings. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting together the newsletter. If you have any Python and hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub in the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter repo, tap at sign and underscore engineer, or hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon or X, or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. Um, so now we'll go ahead um, and I will read um, some stuff about uh, that we got culled from the newsletter. Um, first of all, uh, importantly, uh, next Friday, um, August, or sorry, next, yes, next Friday, August 16th, is CircuitPython Day 2024. We typically have a CircuitPython Day once a year, around August or September. This year, it's August 16th. Um, it's the snakiest day of the year, and we designate it as CircuitPython Day. Adafruit will have special shows and more, some pre-recorded and some live. If you're working with CircuitPython, you can tag your projects, uh, hashtag CircuitPythonDay2024 on social media, and if Adafruit will look to highlight them. Do you have events that you'd like folks to attend or have projects in the works? Also tag those events, CircuitPythonDay2024. You can stay tuned for additional details, and there is a link in the chat and in the notes. Okay. Uh, next up, um, Hackspace Magazine says farewell. Hackspace Magazine, issue 81, which was just released, will be the last as the publication is folded into the Magpie Magazine. Hackspace featured a good amount of MicroPython and CircuitPython and Python content. Uh, the Magpie Magazine will grow and uh, have more pages, and that will feature content that was formerly in Hackspace Magazine. And there's a link to that in the uh, notes as well. Um, next up, uh, I just want to note that uh, this uh, we're getting taking content from the 299th issue of the newsletter, uh, Python and Microcontrollers newsletter. So next week it'll be 300, which coincides nicely with uh, CircuitPython Day. 
Um, thanks to all your sub our subscribers in advance for your loyalty. If you have any special content you'd like to consider for the special issue, you can send links to cpnews at adafruit.com. And finally, as I uh, mentioned, um, all this news stuff comes from the Python and Microcontrollers Weekly Newsletter. Uh, please send us stuff at C to cpnews at adafruit.com. We'd love to see your news items. Tell us about your projects or about stuff that you've seen that's interesting. It has to do with CircuitPython, MicroPython, or Python in general. And that is it for the community news section. So next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, this is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our su status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core libraries and Blinka. First up, overall, um, we had 15 pull requests merged in the past week by nine authors. Some new um, authors I'm not familiar with who may or may not have contributed before are Simon LDWG and Grand Inquisitor. Um, there were three reviewers, and there were six closed issues, issues closed by three people and 11 opened by 10 people. So we've got some more issues to look at. Uh, next up is the core section. And uh, Scott, are you available to read that? Yeah, happy to. Okay, so uh, for the core, here's the numbers. This is the C uh, core to CircuitPython. Uh, generally, it was a quiet week. Um, many of us were out because it's summertime. Uh, we had two pull requests merged from two folks, R. Pavlik and Webley. Uh, thanks to R. Pavlik, they're infrequent. Uh, Webley's a bot, <laughs> and one reviewer myself. Uh, we had 20 open pull requests, so again, we're comfortably under our one-page target, which is 25. Issues-wise, we had two closed issues by two people and three open by two people, so quiet uh, generally as well, for a total of 714 open issues. Uh, we have four active milestones. I think it's new that I added a 920, uh, which has zero open issues, but uh, we're obviously not ready for 92 yet. Um, we also do have nine open issues on 91X, so there is some work uh, to stabilize uh, the stable version of CircuitPython right now. Um, it's just kind of been uh, backburnered a bit because uh, both Dan and I are heads down on some bigger tasks that we just don't want to interrupt ourselves on quite yet. Um, so that's generally a, an overview of the milestones. This is milestones, as I usually say, are just for tracking Adafruit-funded prioritization. Um, if folks find other issues, even if they're marked long-term, for example, uh, you're, we're happy to support you doing that. It's just not work that we're going to be doing in, imminently ourselves. And that's it for the core. All right, thank you, Scott. Okay, next up we have the library section, which is read by Fovi Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, this, uh, this section, section covers, covers all the CircuitPython, all the CircuitPython libraries, libraries, which you can find uh, listed on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. These tend to be uh, either driver libraries to help you interface with a particular piece of hardware or helper libraries to allow you to write a CircuitPython project at a bit of a higher level without worrying about um, as many of, many of the um, granular details. Um, across all those libraries this week, we had 13 pull requests merged by seven authors. Um, I think uh, the names mentioned as newer or less frequent uh, were noted in the, the overall section, so um, I'll skip those. Those are the same, I think, but thanks to all of our uh, new as well as our uh, authors that do contribute more frequently. Uh, we had three reviewers this week, thanks to Melissa, myself, and Scott. Uh, in terms of the pull requests that were merged this week, the oldest uh, handful, actually the oldest four, were about 128 days old, and the newest several ones were down at one day. Uh, that leaves us after the week with 45 pull requests open. The oldest one is a draft at 718 days. The newest one is one day. There were three issues closed in the last seven days by uh, one person, and there were seven new issues opened up by seven people. That leaves us with 864 open issues across all these libraries, and there are 103 of those that are marked as good first issues which you can find listed over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is where you should go if you are interested in getting involved in, with, um, excuse me, involved with CircuitPython 
uh, on the contribution side, either uh, reviewing code or even submitting your own code uh, to the project. On that page, circuitpython.org slash contributing, you'll find a list of open PRs and open issues. You can look through the list to find something that interests you and then uh, click through to GitHub. If it is a uh, PR, you can take a look at the changed code, leave a comment letting us know that you looked it over. If you have the hardware for it, try it out. Leave a comment letting us know how it went. Um, once you get comfortable um, leaving comments on those PRs, we can get you leveled up to leave official reviews as well, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, also on that page, circuitpython.org slash contributing, you can click over to the open issues uh, and again, find a list of links that are going to take you into GitHub. These ones are looking for someone to volunteer to actually submit some code to either uh, add a new feature or fix some bug or something like that. So again, you can look through the list, find something that interests you, um, go ahead and uh, click through to GitHub and then um, you know try to write the code for whatever that feature is or bug fix or whatever uh, is in that issue and actually submit your own PR uh, to that repository. Um, if you are new to Git uh, or GitHub, we have a guide that can help you through the process of contributing to our libraries using those utilities. We also have folks who are going to be around on Discord uh, who are very uh, happy to help you get spun up. So if you are interested in uh, either reviewing or contributing, but you feel like you need help with some particular part of the process, please come join us on Git or, uh, excuse me, please come join us on Discord, say hi, uh, and let us know what you're working on, and uh, there will be folks who are happy to help you out. Uh, in terms of the library PyPI uh, download stats for this week, we had, let's see, a lot of sixes here, 166,667 downloads across the 331 libraries this week uh, on PyPI. There is a top tens list here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at it, and the updated library, the only one this week was the requests library, and that's what we've got in the library land for now. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Tim. Okay, uh, next up is our Blinka section, uh, read by Melissa. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had zero pull requests merged. We had uh, four open pull, we currently have four open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 100 open issues. There were 16,249 PyPI downloads in the last week, 17,727 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at up to 145 supported boards. And that's it. All right, thank you, Melissa. All right, our next major section is Hug Reports. Let me take a timestamp. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or missing the meeting, I'm happy to read your notes when I get to them in the list. All right, so I will start and take a timestamp for myself. Um, I, uh, my periodic thanks to the translators who um, keep up with message changes as we add features or change things in CircuitPython. Uh, we really appreciate those people. They are mentioned in the release notes, but go largely unsung otherwise. And we really appreciate uh, them keeping up with translations. And also thanks this week to Deshipu, who has done uh, looked at several graphics improvements and has a PR in the works at the moment. And next up is Anne. Uh, do you want me to read it, or do you want to speak, Anne? I'll speak for once. I mean, hi everybody. Usually, I'm, I'm, I've been keeping busy lately. But I thought since I'm working on Circuit Python Day, I would go ahead and grace you with my voice. Um, I've been working on coordinating uh, things for Circuit Python Day um, coming up on the sixteenth. Liz has been helping me specifically in coordinating folks. Um, uh, schedule talks and, and various things on the day. Um, I'm going to be publishing a uh, schedule of uh, events and talks um, this week. And uh, thank you for everybody who's um, offered to uh, participate. And uh, besides the normal participation, anybody can participate. They can do projects. They can uh, 
hype the day. They can do all kinds of things. We we ask that you um, tag any of your uh, blog posts, social media, whatever, with hashtag CircuitPythonDay2024, and that way we can find it, and we'll try to amplify that in Adafruit um, social media, um, likely especially the blog. So uh, I appreciate that. And um, I want to give a, a periodic thanks to everybody who helps contribute to the newsletter. Um, a lot of folks uh, send things in via cpnews at adafruit.com, via email, but there are people who have done it all kinds of ways, tagging me, uh, Ann underscore engineer on Twitter. Um, some people reach out on Discord. I'm not on Discord as much, but uh, I people usually alert me to those kinds of things. Um, just uh, all kinds of different ways. I really, really appreciate it because um, gathering all that information every week is a very complex process, and it's basically all me. And I'm searching the whole internet for new and exciting things. So when people can actually say they've seen something and let me know, or they're working on something that's way cool, um, that just helps me immensely. So, uh, and the things that you all doing are outstanding. I'd love to feature uh, neat and creative things. So uh, um, I wanna give you guys thanks. Um, big hugs. That's it. All right. Thank you, Anne. Okay. Uh, next up is um, C. Grover, and I'll read theirs. Thanks to Foamy Guy, C A N C H 4 N S U K 3, and Deshi Poo for working on and improving .png image load. Looking forward to a better life, graphically speaking. And then uh, next up is Deshi Poo. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy for inspiring me to work on the image load library and reviewing my patches. Thanks to CH4 and SUK3 for image load improvements and inspiration as well. All right, and now next up is uh, DJ Devon. Uh, thanks to Jerry Ann for their initial commit on combining both RFM95 and RFM69 libraries into a single library and having it become an official Adafruit library. That library is called Adafruit CircuitPython RFM, and please try it if, you haven't, if you're interested and haven't already. Thanks to CH4 and SUK3 and Deshipu for steamrolling through full PNG support this week. It's been a long time coming for transparency and true color PNG. Thanks to Foamy Guy for live streaming PR reviews for image load, image load JPEG and PNG on both Friday and Saturday. Thanks to squid.jpg for a phenomenal secret lunchbox puzzle program note. There's a link to that in the um, notes. Thanks to Toddbot for a cool YouTube video on investigating audio pops in CircuitPython on an oscilloscope. There's a link to that also. And thanks to Maker Melissa for continually improving the online CircuitPython code editor. Thanks to Scott and Dan H for all the work on BLE ESP32 S3 at MicroPython Merges. Thanks to Jepler for sharing the wonderful Safari vacation pictures. Hope you're enjoying it out there. Please watch out for lions and a group hug. All right, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thank you. Um, hug reports for me this week. Thanks uh, to uh, CH4 in SUK3 uh, and to Shipu, both for improvements in uh, image load library to the PNG uh, handling, as mentioned. Um, thanks to Paul Cutler for interest introducing me to a project called Beware uh, and a pointer to a link that illustrates its usage with Django. Uh, thanks to Tyeth and to Shipu for introducing me to PyScript as well this week, which I hadn't seen before and uh, looks super cool. I'm happy. I'm excited, I should say, to look into that further. Uh, thanks to Anne and Liz for all their work coordinating uh, CircuitPython Day coming up on the 16th, and a group hug for everybody. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, and next up is Jerry. Yeah, hi. Uh, a group hug for me. Nice to, nice to be here. All right, thanks. And next, Maker Melissa. I want to give a hug to you and uh, Justin for setting up the beta site and group hug to everyone else. All right. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. And next is Paul Cudler. Paul, you're very quiet at my end. All right, thank you. And next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug uh, to Dishiku for digging into the image loading code. A uh, hug to Eternity Forest for digging into lowering the power on ESP chips uh, during light sleep. And a uh, hug to EGJ Morrington for guide feedback on the CircuitPython uh, library learning guide. Okie dokie. And finally, I'll read uh, Todd Botts. Um, thanks to PR Cudler for all his work on making the Bootloader podcast happen. Thanks to Gallagher uh, for his great video tutorials on CircuitPython. There's a link to that. Thanks to Heathen UK for work on a VGM player for CircuitPython. Could be a great way to easily add music for games and such. And thanks to Chim Chinaski and Jepler for exploring I2S audio in and opening up the possibility of real-time audio filtering, which is very exciting to me. Okie dokie. So that concludes Hug Reports. Our next major section is status updates. Um, status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start as before, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically, uh, take a couple of minutes, to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. You could also provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can always move it to in the in the weeds section. Okie dokie. So now I'll take a timestamp for myself. Um, I was on vacation last week, so not a lot happened. Uh, when I left, I was working on the MicroPython version 1.22 merge. Um, it's actually working out pretty well. Uh, the builds that I've tested work. I've tested BLE and Wi-Fi and you know Blink and stuff like that, and they're working on all the major board families. Uh, I need to fix uh, a number of test failures, but uh, these are for kind of uh, async I/O or select or some other more obscure things. So I hope that won't take too long to fix. And next up is Anne. Um, hi, everybody. Um, like I said, working um, on CircuitPython Day, and please use the hashtag if you have anything, or maybe even if you see anything, do a reply and put the hashtag, and then then we'll see it. And um, finally, I, I believe Dan said it um, in the newsletter that the upcoming issue is the 300th, so it's a nice landmark. We hit those kinds of landmarks very slowly because there's only one newsletter every week. So uh, every 50 is approximately uh, one year. Um, uh, I've not always been the editor. Um, Bill was doing the newsletter. I believe Scott was doing early newsletters. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but um, it's... Tony started it. Cool. Okay. Um, but I've been doing it um, mainly since uh, um, maybe even before COVID hit. Yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah, Tony and Scott and Bill actually liked doing it. Um, if you don't know, he, he really got into that. And uh, he was uh, kind of sad to, uh, you know, be going off and running uh adafruit more as as things uh, grew um he he even came as a guest editor one time uh but uh i'm there now and uh it it does occupy some of my time but i really like getting information out to the community so uh thank you very much uh for all the help you've given me to get to number 300 and and uh i appreciate helping the community all right thank you Anne. okay next up uh is 
DJ Devin 3. And I'll read theirs. Um, uh, due to recent updates for soft keyboard and image load, I've been updating some of my touchscreen GUIs with the new features. The ability to use a wider variety of image formats while interacting with the online APIs is much easier now. Working on new Adafruit Request API examples for basic image downloads with multiple image formats. Have family visiting this week that I haven't seen in a decade along with one tiny new family member. I'm now a great uncle. Time flies. Okay, congratulations. And uh, next up is Deshipu. I'll read theirs. Uh, did some old to-dos around display I.O. and images. I will try working on some sound effects next. That sounds exciting. Okay. And next up is Foamy Guy. Uh, all right, last week I started merging the previously created PRs um, that were switching libraries over to Ruff after updating those to um, the configuration that we settled on when we talked about it a couple weeks back. Um, I built a quick uh, proof of concept of a web app that converts cookie cutter from a command line tool into a web page based uh, form. There are links here uh, if you want to give that a try or see the code. Uh, and I have a note to talk a little bit more about it in the weeds as well. Um, I tested and reviewed a couple PRs on the image load library that have been mentioned that add easier support for um, transparency with PNGs as well as um, RGB and grayscale uh, PNGs are now supported as well. Um, I tested a fix in Blinka Display.io that makes it compatible with the sleep functionality that's found on some uh, specific OLED displays. And I have begun brainstorming ideas uh, for a game to work on on CircuitPython Day Game Jam stream. Uh, I built a quick proof of concept of a breakout style game and I've dreamed up several ideas that I want to add to it. Uh, but I am also still considering some other options uh, as well. Um, and that's what I've been working on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay, next up is Jerry. There's that button. Uh, oh, where'd it go? Uh, yeah, so finally, at long last, I've submitted the PR with the initial commit for a new library that uh, combines um, the RFM 6.9 and RFM 9x library or support. Oh, just a minute. Where did that get out of here? I'm um, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, so the, there's a PR out there with the uh, with the initial code in it. Um, the biggest changes are, are that it adds the use, the ability to use, and it, it, it underneath it uses async I/O, uh, so it requires async I/O. And then I also added uh, to the RFM 9x side the support for FSK and OOK modulation. And the nice thing about that is that means that the RFM RFM 69 boards and RFM 9x boards can now communicate with each other if you if you use FSK or OK modulation. So that opens up some capabilities. And um, but it would be nice if, if anybody, especially someone, could take a look at the async I/O implementation and let me know if it looks reasonable. I'm hoping that you know it's it's at least a good starting point. But uh, certainly looking forward to and you know would like some some feedback on that. And otherwise, anyone testing it, if you ha have existing RFM code, it should be minimal change to, to make it, to, to get it to work. Just really changing the, the, uh, the initial, the uh, library name in, in your initialization should be the minimal you need to, to use existing code. It wasn't meant to break anything or very few things. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jerry. OK, Maker Melissa is up next. Hello. Um, so we have a CircuitPython code editor beta website at code-beta.circuitpython.org. And I'll put that down in the notes uh, here. Um, and that has the latest features. If anybody would like to be a beta tester and try out the site, that would be awesome. Uh, if, if you find any issues, just open up a GitHub issue. Uh, on that site, I uh, over the last uh, couple weeks, because I wasn't here last week, I worked on improving the reliability of the USB workflow. I added a uh, feature to allow performing mul or features to allow performing multiple file operations at the same time, such as file selection, deleting, downloading, and moving. Uh, and that is uh, for all the workflows. 
and then displaying additional also being able to display additional information about the board and all the workflows. And then I'm finishing up some minor improvements today and working on prepping uh, to film video for Sticker Python Day. And that's where I'm at. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next I'll read Paul Cutler's contribution. Um, new episode of the Bootloader, Bootloader podcast with Todd Bot is out today. Todd Bot and I will be doing a live episode for Circuit Python Day. Details will be coming soon. All right, thank you, Paul. And finally, Scott will round things out. Hello, sorry, I'm a little slow. I turned my AC off. Um, I fixed the passcode based encryption for Matter, uh, for Circuit Matter, so I can now decode the first secure channel message. Uh, which is awesome. <laughs> I was happy to see that happen, and, and I got an error about some enum that I don't have to find. Uh, because the next thing for me to do is work on what's called what they call the interaction model. I think it's model. Um, which is probably the layer that user code will work on as well. So this is the, the layer where they have definitions for clusters and attributes and commands. And so for a particular light bulb, they say a light bulb must have these clusters. Um, so that's all kind of done in this interaction model layer that I've begun work on um, for circuit matter. And uh, deep dive on Friday. So uh, come uh, join me on Friday to learn more. OK, thank you. OK, so that finishes off um, status reports. Thanks, everybody. Uh, please uh, consider contributing next week if you have something. Uh, next, find the final section is the in the weeds section, um, where we uh, have long form discussions of things that might come out of status updates or things that just people want to bring out, bring up that might elicit some discussion. So I'll start with um, Tim, who has uh, something about a web based cookie cutter form. So go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I um, this this came out of um, trying to help somebody in the Discord last week who was having trouble with cookie cutter, um, and it, it turned out to be that there used to be some differences on Windows, um, but there it's no longer the case. Actually, you can actually use the same cookie cutter across all the different platforms right now. But um, as I was helping this person work through this problem, I kind of got to thinking about this idea of couldn't. Um, couldn't we move cookie cutter into a server or some kind of centralized thing, which would then uh, make it easier for folks to be able to use. So um, I basically just wanted to mention it and gauge kind of high level interest and see if it's something that there is any interest in actually refining further um, or continuing to use, uh, or um, if not, that's totally fine too. It was also partially just an exercise and I wonder if I can do this. Um, in terms, it, it, so like the basic idea here is to take cookie cutter, which today is a command line tool. You run it, you point it to our CircuitPython library uh, cookie cutter template. It then asks you a series of questions, which you answer, you know, just right there in the command line in the terminal. And then when you're done, it spits out a project folder that has been populated, you know, based on all of the answers to your questions. Um, it's a super neat utility. It's, it's very, very helpful if you are trying to uh, publish a CircuitPython library, especially if you want to have it put into uh, like the community bundle or, or any bundle really, because it generates all the files that are needed for all the different bits of infrastructure that we have built up. Um, so this takes that idea away from the command line and just moves it into a web page where you load the page you end up with kind of a big form with all the same questions that you would ordinarily um, answer at the command line, but instead they're just uh, text boxes on a page. Um, theoretically, this could also include some more detailed information about each of those questions and what the responses actually mean and stuff like that. Um, in the proof of concept that I've built so far, the, the details are kind of cryptic. They're actually just the default values uh, from cookie cutter, but I wanted to note it could definitely be customized a bit further and made specific to the circuit python version so we could actually be explaining that stuff and showing examples or something like that if we wanted um the the quick kind of pros and cons in my head for something like this on the pro side it removes the need for the end users to install cookie cutter and all the requirements um it is potentially easier for first-time library contributors just being on a web page i think is something that a lot more folks 
are more comfortable with than the command line. Um, and then it is available on all the OSs from the browser, and it will work the same across all the OSs. So um, in the past, there was that issue with cookie cutter working differently on Windows, and we had differing set of instructions, whether you're on Windows versus Linux or Mac. Uh, it does turn out that's no longer the case. But if we had a system like this, which kind of centralized cookie cutter into some other thing, it will make it so that we never have a problem of diverging behavior across different OSs or something like that. Um, on the cons, really the main, the main downside that I can think of is, um, especially with the way that I have it set up right now, it's requiring some infrastructure, which is not necessarily typical for a lot of our tools. Um, currently, this is built as a Django web app, and it's just hosted inside of a small Linux uh, VPS, um, because those are things that I was comfortable with and um, able to whip up really quickly, just from familiarity with both of them. Um, but I don't know how realistic it is to maintain that for uh, the long term, uh, right? Because that server would need to be um, updated over time and maintained to make sure that it not only stays up to date with um, the latest cookie cutter and everything, but also, you know, just running a web app, it needs to have all of its components updated and stuff like that. Um, in order to remain secure. I think there are other possible ways that this concept could work. So the one that I've built so far is definitely just thrown together as a proof of concept. Another idea that came to mind, um, which I did find some actual prior example, uh, prior art, so to speak of, is a, a GitHub workflow that integrates this. So the if I understand it correctly, the way that one works is you kind of clone this special cookie cutter workflow repo uh, inside of there is a JSON file where you basically go and open up that JSON file and fill in all the answers to all your questions, and then you commit and push that, and then there's an action that runs, grabs all your answers from that JSON file, and uh, runs cookie cutter, populates it for you, and then I, I think it either commits it into a different branch on the repo, or it makes it available as a link or something like that. Um, I do think that is interesting because it, it gets away from the idea of needing um, the virtual server or any kind of backend that stays existing, right? GitHub Actions just spawn a container whenever they need it, they do their work and then they go away, which is compelling. Um, but I do think that it doesn't necessarily, necessarily lower the barrier to entry as far as a web form, uh, just because with that GitHub workflow method, you still pretty much have to um, be familiar with all the Git, uh, potentially command line tools. I know there is a GitHub GUI app and there's a couple other ways that you can interact with Git that aren't on the command line. Um, but for the most part, it is a command line tool. So we're sort of moving, we're sort of shifting the barrier from cookie cutter to Git uh, if we do use something like that. Now, uh, there may potentially be other ways that that could be deployed inside Actions. Um, one idea I had was like maybe if people could like open an issue on a certain repo and then the actions bot could like grab their answers from inside the issue or something. Um, and then that way it could kind of be ported back into being more of a web form. Uh, I have not really gone further down that road though. I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but um, that's kind of a, a dump of all the things going on in my head. And I just wanted to gauge um, interest to see if this was something that anyone else thinks is worthwhile to uh, refine further or continue working on, uh, and if anyone has any other specific ideas about uh, any of the parts of it that I brought up or anything else. Great, thanks. I, I think you could write this entirely in browser-side JavaScript. I mean, you have to fetch the, um, the template files, but... How could, uh, well, so it could potentially... Well... All it, it all has to do is then is it has to... It's collecting info from a form, which you can do locally, and then it has mm -hmm. to plug that info into the templates, and then it has to generate a zip file, and you can do all that in JavaScript, right? I think so. Um, I th think that creating the zip file might be a tricky part in JavaScript. I've done a few different times where I'm trying to dynamically generate a file and then have the user download it. I have had some success with it in some, in some cases, but I have found it to be a little bit tricky in some cases as well. Um, the main thing I would mention, though, is it it could be done that way, but it would effectively be just moving away from cookie cutter at that point, because uh, what I've built today just runs cookie cutter under the hood. So it's really just a layer that exposes that to a new interface on the web. I see what you're uh, saying. I'm, def yeah. I'm definitely open to, um, you know, kind of porting it into a different situation, but it would 
probably be a larger a larger task at that point. Um, but that that may be a really good way to go if it is possible, because then it would get rid of the whole problem of having the server in the back end, right? It could go back to just being hosted on a static um, GitHub pages or something like that. So um, that's definitely an avenue worth exploring for sure. Uh, or or PyScript, yeah. In fact, actually, that's a good idea as well. I wonder if it could somehow utilize one of those Python to JavaScript sort of layers. Yeah, I think that. So Maker Melissa says in, in the notes you can use JSZip, and Deshipu says if it would it work in PyScript. And I think this is a very interesting idea. I mean, maybe even the developer has anybody actually. Maybe this is not something that. Um, it might even be an issue. For, it might even be an open issue for something like this in Cookie Cutter. I don't know. I mean, people always have computers available, so maybe it hasn't really come up. But yeah, um, I did not look specifically through their issues, but I did spend a few minutes searching around uh, Google with things like Cookie Cutter Web Form and and other associated words I could try to come up with. I didn't really find much. Um, in the way out there doesn't mean that it's not there, but it, it didn't uh, didn't come up within a few minutes <laughs> of searching, at least. Okay, well, a, a number of those things think, are interesting. Yeah, I, I think I think it's good to think about lowering the barrier, but I I wonder if if getting away from command line use and Python is just not feasible. And I'm thinking on the other end. So, like, somebody's creating a library, that's in theory, so that they can actually commit it and add it to either a bundle or something. And yeah. a thing that also people hit is pre-commit. And like the really, the best way to do pre-commit is to do it from the command line and have it installed. So I'm like, if, if, if our goal is to do library development without any command line stuff, then we need to do the whole life cycle without command line stuff. Um, otherwise, like, at some point, you're going to have to teach them Python and pip and stuff. And if if you're going to have to do that, you might as well do it with Cookie Cutter. Yeah, and that's definitely a thought that crossed my mind as well. Is like we're it does lower the barrier to entry, but at the end of the day, it's lowering the bar barrier to entry on a on a task that ultimately will still lead to something that is definitely complex at the end of the day, right? Being able to get it pushed um, into GitHub and being able to get pre-commit run are two other barriers that this doesn't doesn't even come close to addressing, which are in line right after pre, um, cookie cutter anyhow. So that's definitely definitely a good a good point. And there may be it may be the case that it's not not worth it to try to kind of make the beginning half of that easier if folks are still just gonna run into the second half of it and have to learn essentially the same same things as well. I can see that point of view as well too. Is, is it also possible, I mean, the main advantage, there are two advantages of the web form that I see. And it's not necessarily an installation thing, because people are going to use PIP already anyway. Uh, one is that you can put in a lot more verbose detail. And the other is that you can go back and change something, because I, I often end up running cookie cutter two or three times because I change my mind in the middle when I see a question that I hadn't occurred to me. And so I, I wonder if just a more a verbose mode of cookie header or something like that, or just put in much more long-winded explanations might help. Uh, yeah. I definitely agree with that sentiment as well. And I, I definitely find myself running pre, um, not pre, I keep getting mixed up with pre-commit now. I find myself running cookie cutter multiple times usually. And I've noticed the the way that it, and, and this may be like my terminal or my OS or something specific to my environment, I don't know about, but I have noticed the, the, the questions at the terminal, they don't support things like the up arrow. Um, and it's kind of difficult sometimes, especially if you are running cookie cutter, you know, three times because you found something you want to change last time or whatever. There's not necessarily a super easy way to copy paste in between. So it's kind of tedious if you end up doing that. Whereas here, um, I do think it would be a bit easier, but it's like it's like at the end of the day, how even though I do typically run cookie cutter three or four times or whatever, at the end of the day, it's still a thing that I do not that frequently. Um, so yeah, yeah. Are All there right. any alternatives to cookie cutter? Because um, one of the main flaws of cookie cutter is that you can't just say, "Hey, update this for this new template." I'm wondering if 
what we really need is a like, I committed this repo, it's got some circuit Python code in it, and now I want to bring Adabot in and say like, hey, like standardize this, <laughs> right? Like add all of these things and, and Adabot can just do a PR to your repo and add all of the, all of the stuff. That would be an interesting way to do it for sure. I'm not aware of other, um, I guess, alternatives to cookie cutter beyond what I would say is I believe cookie cutter is built on a templating engine called Jenja2. Um, and Jenja2 is just a wider templating engine that can be used for anything. In fact, Django uh, web, web framework uses something very similar to Jenja2 for rendering HTML pages. Um, it definitely would be possible to take Jinja 2 and build kind of mold it to to be a template engine that works however we want. Um, and I definitely I do dirty. like Yeah. I mean if we're doing some more logic based stuff, it might be worth just not doing Jinja. Like some of those curly brace things and paths and stuff are really complicated. You know, it'd be much simpler if we just had a script that said like, hey, like you sh you need to file the, this name or like um, if we don't use Jin, well, so I mean, I'm sure there are other templating engines out there, but I do think a lot of them have similar and definitely admittedly complex syntax. Um, if we don't use a, sim a template engine at all, I don't necessarily know how it would be substituting in all of the answers to those values. I mean, I guess there's always string substitution at the end of the day. Um, but at least yeah, off the top of my head, I feel like the template engine makes it a lot easier to substitute in those actual values into those well-structured files. Especially into the files, yeah. Yeah. I don't really like it in the paths. And, and I don't like it if there's a bunch of logic. But Yeah, the paths then, are super weird. The way that it is basically has variables as part of the folder name paths. I'm with you there. That is a bizarre construct that I would definitely be happy to lose. I wonder. Yeah, and, and maybe, maybe there's something like you just need the pyproject.toml and you put in the answers in the pyproject.toml and then it just like uses that as the reference for like filling out everything else. Okay, so I mean, it sounds like there is um, potential in this direction to find something that can make it easier. Um, but it sounds like maybe this exact tool is not it, which I kind—I had the idea that was probably going to be the case anyway, but it sounds like um, a good potential sort of next direction to try to make an, a next proof of concept would be something that uh, sort of works in reverse. You kind of take some existing code in a repo and then you get Adabot or get something to run against your repo and actually add your stuff into it. Um, so it, it could be PR kind of in any form, like so I'm not sure. It has to still adhere to some standards. I, I was well, thinking of a third thing, which is that you could add an extension on the cookie cutter that instead of going through the command line dialog, runs brings up a local Python HTTP server and which serves a page. That it'll it'll yeah. say, hey, click on this link, and the, and the, and you open that in your old browser, and you type that stuff in, and then it collects all that, and it and it, it runs cookie cutter, like it, so the collection. It's only the collection aspect that turns into yeah. a form, and that that would that wouldn't require again that wouldn't require any backend stuff. But that's an extension that that's a really an extension to cookie cutter, to say like how do you right. collect the data of the form instead right. of it being hosted on GitHub. Or remotely, it would just be hosted on your own machine. Yeah, I and I haven't. Um, it's not something I've explored with them, or even looked through issues to see if there's any any prior inquiries around that. But my my instinct is that the cookie cutter team might essentially say something like, "We we make it possible to access cookie cutter programmatically, so you could collect the answers in any way that you want, and then feed them in effectively the same way I did in this little Django." Um, yeah. Yeah. This little Django app. I'm with you. I think it would be nice at the cookie cutter level to provide a different way to do it. I don't know if they will be open to that, um, but it's definitely worth exploring. I could well, open an look issue at over issues. there and yeah. see, yeah. kind of dip the toes in and see if that's something they'd be they'd be willing to do. Because the, the other thing is the way I built this 
is relatively general. It should work theoretically for any cookie cutter template, but I did limit it down to only ours because I also don't necessarily want just any random template being generated on the server. Um, so I, you know, I I don't necessarily see the exact thing I built as like specific to Circuit Python. It could definitely be a thing that's more broad that they could either incorporate into cookie cutter or could just exist as a third party thing that gets used alongside cookie cutter. Um. Okay, well, I think we have a bunch of things to look at. So, yeah. Great. Yes, thank you everybody for, for all the feedback. Thank I appreciate you. This is exactly why, why in the weeds is, is a useful, is a great thing. Okay, anybody else? Yep. Anything to say? Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, if not, I'll go on to the last item. Uh, which is uh, a note by Toddbot, which was sort of answered, but we'll read it anyway. Toddbot asked, is there a command line tool for interacting with the file system via the web workflow? And they said, oh, Circup will do this for libraries, but I don't think for arbitrary files. I'm thinking something like MP Remote. And then I wrote to him in Discord and said that, Tim, you're working on it, and it's called WW Shell, and you put a link in. So... Uh, We've meant, this has been mentioned a few times, this WW shell, but take a look at the pull request uh, in CIRCUP that uh, does this WW shell and see what you think of it. Try it out. Okay. Uh, anything else? If not, okay, we'll, we'll uh, finish off the meeting. Um, this has been the Circuit Pike. Python uh, weekly meeting for uh, Monday, August 5th. Um, thank you to everybody who participated in multiple ways. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, the meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit Adafruit Daily to subscribe. Next week is not a holiday, so the next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific time. So that's Monday, August 12th. If you want to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at sign circuit Python East Israel on Discord. So we'll see you next week, folks. Thank you, everybody. And I will stop recording.